good to be with you this morning. A lot of friends in here from uh, TCIW, so thank you all for being a part of this time this morning. I appreciate uh, your pastor inviting us to come and be a part of what God is doing in this great state of Wisconsin. And uh, I know God's doing some great things in this part of our country. And uh, so greetings from Louisiana. Uh, my wife and I are originally from Baton Rouge. And my wife's name is Tammy. If y'all don't know her, please try to meet her before you leave today. Uh, originally, we started out in Pastor Lee Ship's church uh, at First New Testament down in Baton Rouge. Uh, got saved there 25 years ago, traveled with him uh, on numerous 30 plus countries and uh, probably nearly 60, 70 mission trips outside the country. And uh, traveled as an evangelist for years. And um, here last year, God called us to pastor a church in West Monroe, Louisiana, which is where the, uh, the Doug Dynasty people uh, are from. So some people know West Monroe by that, but uh, maybe you're familiar with that. But we've been at it for about 12 or 14 months now, and God has really blessed us. Uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about it if you'd like to know about it. But thank you all for having us today, and um, I appreciate uh, your pastor um, and this wonderful church. Denise, we're so glad you're feeling better. Wonderful friends of ours. We've been knowing them for probably about five years now, and they've been a great blessing to Tammy and I and our church as well uh, down in Baton Rouge. But I, I want to encourage you today. I've been listening to the prayer request, and I'd just like to encourage you for a moment that the Bible says your steps are ordered by God. How many of you believe that this morning? You know, whatever you're going through this morning doesn't matter. Um, if it's really hard or not so hard, um, God already knows, and I know you know this, but I'm just confirming with you that God already knows your troubles. Um, he's Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and end. So all of this he knew about before you were ever come out of your mother's womb. He knew where you'd be in this time frame of life, and he's ordered your steps. How many of you know that? And no matter what comes across your way, the Bible says all things work out for good for those who love him and are called according to, the pur to his purpose. We nod our heads and amen that and we shout when we hear it. Can I encourage you to live in it? Just stand upon it. Let, let that be before your eyes. Write it on your mirror in your bathroom. You know, God is with me. Then who can be against me, right? And there's no, there's no weapon formed against you that's gonna prosper because God's got your life in his hands and these are promises that God has given to us and I'm so thankful for it this morning. And so I pray that you would just continually to stand on the promises that God has given to us and be encouraged by that because that's why God gives us that, right? The Bible says that the devil roams to and fro seeking whom he can devour and he said in whom you and I resist how we resist him by faith and faith comes by hearing the word of God, amen? And so that's why it's important that we saturate our life in this beautiful book we call the Bible because God has given us great and precious promises that we can stand on those promises and we're strengthened. We make it through every day because we stand on what God said and not what the enemy's trying to say or the way that we physically think, amen? So thank you all for allowing us to be here. Um, I want to tell you that if you came in here one way, you're going to leave a different way. And I say that with complete confidence in the authority of God's word and his promises for us, because I believe if you've come in here seeking for Jesus, you've already found him. And he's already been ministering to you from the time you got out of your car and come into this building to fellowship with the body today. And so God is going to do something in your life where when you leave here, you are going to see Jesus greater than you did yesterday because I believe the Holy Spirit is at work in this room today. And I believe that he is going to give us a deep revelation uh, of things you may have read a hundred thousand times. And things that you shout amen, well, I've read that already, I've already know that. How many of you know there's nothing new under the sun? So, you know, this great book, you know, is pretty thick and we go through it and, you know, you could read the Bible in 12 months. And so you could say, well, I read the Bible, I'm done with that. And so what's new? You know, what, what you got new for us? What, what else you got? Because I've already heard that passage. I, you know, you taught on that last year. Can I tell you what Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season it out. So there's nothing new under the sun and we need to hear this word on a consistent basis. 
in order for God to continually to work things in our life to where we can live by this. And this book is a, is a, is a living word. So it's not something we gain in knowledge, right, Pastor? But it's something that actually transforms our life. Amen? So as we, as we saturate ourselves in this book this morning for a moment, I pray that God would reveal myself to me today. Because, you know, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And that light exposes darkness. And I know that because I'm born again, there's no darkness in me. But darkness tries to surround and, and come in on my outer fleshful guy and my ways of functioning. So the day you were born again, you weren't snatched out of here and made perfect. That day's coming. But until then, according to the Bible, we're being transformed into the image of Christ. We're being perfected by the one that perfects us, amen? We're in the potter's hands and he is shaping and molding our life every single day, cutting out all of the things that are not Christ and causing everything to come out of us that he's put within us in himself, amen? And so as we walk with him, we're being sanctified every single day. And I'm thankful this morning that when I leave today, uh, this word is going to change Jeff Lee. I do not stand up here as a man that has perfected this life. I am a wretched man. Uh, sin comes across my path on a regular basis, just like it comes across your path. But I can tell you what, I am not a slave to sin. I am not bound by the sin that once uh, held me captive. I've been set free, just like you, if you're born again here this morning. So I know that when I sit under this word, he is now the light of my world. And that word lights my life up and it reveals to me what measure and manner of man that I am. And it reveals to me what an awesome Christ and an awesome Savior and an awesome God that we get to serve the very God that created us. Amen. So if you'd pray with me, Father, I thank you for my friends here today. I pray that your word would help us, strengthen us, build our faith in this, in this place today, God. And Holy Spirit, would you allow us to see Jesus in a greater way than we saw him yesterday, Father. We just praise you, we honor you, and we ask it in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen, I wanna talk to you this morning. I know you watch a lot of news, right? There's a lot of crazy things going on in the world today. And we are called as the church of God or the church of Jesus Christ or the body of Christ, we are not having church this morning, we are the church. We are the hands and feet that God has left in this world in the hour that we live. So everywhere you go, work, school, your homes, God is now working in you to bring the life of Jesus Christ to the world around you everywhere you go. There's no way out of it. The day you were born again, you became a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so everywhere you go, God is going to pour his life out through your life all over the Wisconsin area and everywhere that you travel. There's a world out there that is hearing and seeing and perceiving and making a graven image of what God they think he's like. There's a lot of people in the world that claim themselves Christian that's not Christian at all. They just hold to the character. I believe in Christian beliefs. I go to church every Sunday. So, you know, I prayed the prayer. I'm all right with God. And they're never been born again. There are thousands and millions of people in the United States that sit that way which is a sad thing. And then they go out into the world and they want to try to portray or try to live the life of a Christian that none of us can live apart from that rebirth, amen? If you're not regenerated, you'll never, you'll never put out the life of Christ. You'll try to do what Jesus did, but there will be no, no, no way to perfect that. You will not do what Jesus did. You can read about what he's did, but to perform that, it's impossible unless you're regenerated and the Holy Spirit lives in us. So Jesus made a statement, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. 
Now, that's Matthew 5, and I thought about that. And you're thinking about good works. You know, we think about, well, we bake a cake for somebody. We go on a mission trip. We call somebody and um, tell them that you love them. Um, you know, we can do outreaches in our community and feed people and hand out tracts and Bibles and just do all sorts of things. We can go down when the hurricanes come down in Baton Rouge and, or, or wherever, Florida, help people rebuild their homes. We go to the Dominican. We hold uh, medical outreach dental outreach, really helping people. Those are good works, right? And by all means, we could glorify God in that. But how many of you know that there's a lot of people in the world that do those very things and they're not saved at all. They're just humanitarians. People do it all the time. So people aren't going to look at all these people and say, oh, we're glorifying you, uh, God in heaven. I'm going to glorify the God that, you know, this man, uh, Aaron, um, is, is serving. They don't really care about that. So when I read that, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. There must be something special about what they're seeing. Because if they're seeing something that's the same as the, all the humanitarians, then they're not going to really glorify God for that, right? So if you back up in Matthew and begin to read there and it starts talking about, you know, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit, spirit, blessed are you if you are persecuted for righteous sake. And then you get down to this portion of the passage where it says, you know, you're the salt of the earth. You know, if the salt loses its savor, it can't flavor no more. And then he goes on to say, you're the light of the world. I believe that that life that you read there in Matthew is something that's produced in your life and that's what people are going to see, the peacemaker, the one that's laying his life down, the one that is, you know, when, when he's being, uh, you know, persecuted, he's not reviling back. It's the person that is putting on the characteristics that you see from those passages prior to getting to this verse. And I believe that's when they're going to see Jesus and they're going to be amazed by that. They're going to see that peculiar person, right? A peculiar people, a holy nation. They're going to see that life and they're going to, be a, they're going to become people that begin to glorify God by something that they see different that the rest of the world cannot produce. Are you with me this morning? So I've titled this message, and I don't do this all the time, Actions Speak Louder. Um, there's a, there's a, a phrase that people say, you know, actions speak louder than words. I mean, that to be true. You know, people say things all the time, but if you don't come through with what you're going to say, then, you know, people aren't going to hold much, uh, much towards you. So actions speak louder. Somebody says, I love you, and they treat you like a dog, then do they really love you? You know, if, they, if you say, well, you know, I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that, and it don't come through, then... There's no value to what somebody says. And people say, I love you all the time. People do things all the time. But their life is just something produced that's different from that. Well, I can tell you what, our great Savior, Jesus Christ, who was all God, yet all man and came into this world, he was one who produced what he said. So if he said something, he produced that. And as born-again believers, God has given us now the ability by the Holy Spirit to produce what is being said from this great book now being manifested out of this life that we live as we call ourselves Christians here this morning. Amen. In John 13, 35, if you want to write these scriptures down this morning, Jesus made a statement. He said, all men will know that you are my disciples by... Your ability to single the praise team by how many times you go to church, by how many bumper stickers you got that says Jesus saves, uh, by your K Love radio station, um, by how many Bible studies you attend, by how many prayer meetings you go to, how much money you give to the church, how often you fast. If you see all of this, that's my disciples. Is that what it says? He said, all men will know that you're my disciples by your what? Love. Say it again real loud. Love. Your love one for another. So I told somebody the other day when I was ministering to them, it 
doesn't matter what people say. I'm a Christian. I go to this church or that church. I'm part of this ministry or that ministry. You can do all of those things in a, according to 1 Corinthians 13 without love. It is just a clanging symbol. It doesn't mean anything whatsoever. And so it's extremely important that you're a born again believer because number one, you're going to go to hell when you die. Number two, you're not going to manifest the life of Christ nowhere that you go. And when people look at your life, you're going to be a, mis a misrepresentation of the actual life of the God that we serve. Amen? So I'm thankful for the Lord this morning. It's love. I, I say this all the time, that the devil can mimic all sorts of things about church life. He can mimic praise and worship. He can mimic speaking in tongues. He can mimic praying over people. He can do signs and wonders, okay? Antichrist is going to do a lot of those things. And he can mimic all the, all oh, and the, uh, and the purity and the videos and the suits and the shouting and the preaching. He can do all of that. No problem at all. And it'll look just like what we see in Christian world today. Oh, that's so sweet. That word was so powerful. Don't you think he knows this great book as well as anybody? He knows this book better than I do. He can quote it all day long. He's not going to grasp it like we do because he's the, whole, the Holy Spirit's not there. But he knows how to do all of these things. But there's one thing he cannot mimic, and that is agape love. Because agape love is God. Because the Bible says God is love. And so in your life, out of every attribute that comes out of you that looks like Jesus, the very number one thing that is going to be a distinct stamp, this one belongs to me. This is a Christ-like in character, born-again Christian. The world is going to see love. They're going to see love come out of you for the Father which is the greatest commandment of this great book, and they're going to see the love that you have for people, which is what this great book says is the second greatest commandment. And the law and the prophets hinge on these two. And how can a man say that he loves God if he can't love the person that's around him? Because your proof, according to this great book, is your proof that you love God is the way you love people. How are you today? Hallelujah. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about genuine, agape, unconditional love that lays its life down for other people. Now, some people try to lay their life down for other people because I want you to know that I'm loving people. I want you to follow me. I want you to notice me. People try to do that all the time. How are you today? Good to have you. Y'all ever been around that before? And sometimes it's just really fake and, and people don't really care about you at all. Anybody can notice the difference in that? You know why we notice the difference in that? Because there is a difference in that. And when you can feel the love of Jesus Christ without me saying a word, I've been around people where I can just look into their eyes and I can feel the love of God. And then when they begin to speak and you hang out with that person, they begin to produce what's being said. You see more of an action than you do something that comes out. And that, my friend, is what's going to transform the world around you. Nothing else. The gospel is the greatest act of love that God has ever produced in this world. Jesus said he would come he came born as a virgin, and then he did what he said he was coming to do. There was an action in that. Amen? And I'm thankful for that this morning. I want you to turn in your Bibles, Philippians 2. Read this with me, verse 1 through 8. Write these scriptures down. I'll say like your pastor does, study to show yourself approved. Number one, to teach yourself, okay? Let the Holy Spirit allow these words to come alive in you. <clears throat> saturate your life in them. If there therefore be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, just really think about these. Fulfill my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, 
being of one accord and of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem others better than themselves. Now the world's not going to produce that. I'm just telling you now. No way. It's all about me, right? But listen. Look not every one on or every man on his own interests, but every man also on the interests of others. And I can tell you only Jesus is going to produce that out of us. There's a picture there. Jesus said in verse 5, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. And he became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. Here's God, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. He's looking into a world that he created and all men are now lost because of what happened in the garden. And God said, I am going to send the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the world that anyone that would believe upon my son whom I'm sending, I will cleanse their conscience. I will quicken them. I will make them alive if they would believe on this. And God did exactly what he said he would do. And he sent Jesus to come into this world. And, and Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen my father. He made numerous statements <clears throat> throughout the New Testament about people noticing who he was, noticing how he acted, noticing. He said, if you don't believe me by the words I speak, at least believe me by the very works that I do. You remember, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. So you want to see good works? What did Jesus look like when we read in those passages what are the works that came out of his life and number one work was the work of love he displayed that right off the bat when he came and stepped out of heaven and was born as an infant lowly riding a donkey into Jerusalem he wasn't this big whoa look at this guy no big ministry no spotlight he was lowly we're talking about God God didn't drive a Mercedes God didn't have a suit like this. You know what he did? He wore a robe and sandals like the rest of them. He was lowly. He was meek because he didn't want the world looking at him as this big flashy guy. I want you to notice my works. And that's why Paul made the statement, I don't come with enticing words of man's wisdom, but I come in a demonstration of the power of God so that men's faith would not be in me or man but that your faith would be in God. And that's the portion where the Holy Spirit has got to be at work because he is always going to glorify God. He is always going to make Jesus known. He is always going to manifest the love of God out of the human that he has quickened and made alive. Are you with me today? That's the work of God. And that world is dying every day around us and very much desiring to see the Christ that the Bible talks about. And not some Christ that's been made up by what we call Christianity in the world today. It's quite sick what I see out there in the name of Jesus today. So far from the truth of this book, this book's been twisted in every direction. But I want you to notice this morning, if we are going to function the way that Jesus has, has in, in, you know, desired for us to function in the spirit, then I need to see God's great love for me. If I'm going to love other people, then I need a revelation of how much God loves me. If I'm going to forgive people, then I need to know how much God has forgiven me. So it all starts with you and your relationship with God. If I'm going to get a revelation of the gospel of Jesus Christ that I know is going to change that world out there, you come talk to Jeff Libro, and I'm going to tell you what, I've been born again because I've got a revelation of what Jesus did for me. 
When you see that passage where it says those who love much have been forgiven much, you know what that means? They understand how much God loved them. They understand what a wretched man that they were and they're not going to make it in life without God. And they've been quickened and made alive and set free and they're no longer a slave. And because of that, I got no problems telling the world around me about that. I'm in an intimate relationship. I'm not trying to learn about God. I'm not trying to learn, okay, what did Jesus do? I need to go do this so that I can get people in my church. I need to go love such and such so that when people see me, they be, oh, they're so sweet. Hey, come to my church. Come join into this Christian life that I belong to. And, and, and sadly, that's what it's come to today. Nothing wrong with inviting people to your church. Don't take me wrong. I'm not saying don't go to people and invite people, love them. I'm talking about a life that is, that is naturally manifesting the life of Jesus Christ without me trying to go do something. Because when we do it, we mess it up. Every time we mess it up. Even as believers, we go try to do something. God says, I never asked you to do that. But Jesus did everything his father asked him to do. And the very greatest act was love when he stepped out of heaven and he went to the cross and he died for our sin. And when we get a revelation that it's my sin that put Jesus on the cross. It was me that was nailing the spikes in his hands. It was me that was spitting on him. It was me that was bruising him. How do I know? I got a revelation from God. My destructive sin in my own life is what put that man on the cross. I was the one in the crowd screaming, crucify him. It was my sin. And you know what? It was God's love for me. When I stood at the base of the cross looking up at my Savior, and Jesus looked up and said, Father, would you forgive Jeff? For he knows not what he does. He's blind. He's lost. He doesn't realize that his sin has put me here. But I'm going to give him a revelation of it so that he will cherish and that you would cherish the love that God has for you. Then the gospel doesn't look like some turn or burn. Get your life right, dude, or you're going to die in hell. Get your tail in church and clean your life up. If you don't, God's going to get you. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the picture that we've drawn in our head that we take to the world. But when a person has been forgiven and God has come and rescued them from a life of misery, when I had deceived myself thinking sin was it, the Spirit of God gave us a revelation to see what manner of people in the day that we broke, all that we would stay in that same brokenness. My eyes have been made open. I can see Jesus now. And he's so beautiful to me. I want to run tell everybody about this Christ. I don't want to see the world perish. And it's not because they're disgusting sin that they need to get right. It's because how much God loves them. And Jesus died for them. And Jesus deserves this world. We don't go out and preach the gospel because of them. We go out and preach the gospel because of him. It's for him, not them. We're not traveling all over the world going on mission trips to save poor little lost people. Most of the time they could care less whether you're there or not. But we go because Jesus deserves every soul that he died for. And that is the commission that God has given us the honor to go and be a part of in this hour, this dispensation. You you're the church, you're the hands, you're the feet. You're the one that's going to display this life of love we're talking about this morning. How many of you are glad for that today? What an honor. What an honor God's given to us. How many of you are thankful for what Jesus has done for you? I am. Actions speak louder than words. And the action of Christ on that cross was absolutely incredible. The greatest display of love for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish. And look, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, this day is for you. Christ had made, has made this moment for you to hear about how much he loves you and cares about you. Amen? So love is important in your life. Walk with me for a moment. 1 John 4, verse 7. I've put these passages up here. Please write them down. It says in verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone that loves is born of God. Are you hearing me? And knows God. He that loves not, knows not God. That's a fact, guys. For God is love. In this was manifested the love of God towards us, because God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him, here in his love. Not that we love God, but that God loved you first. Amen? And he sent Jesus to be the atonement or the propitiation for your sin. And this last little command here in verse 11, it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. Amen? We hear this passage all the time. But this is, this is absolutely what God wants us to be a part of in this very hour. I love this world. You go love the world. How do I do that? I've put my love in you. I shed my love abroad in your heart by the Holy Ghost. Romans 5, 5. This is what I've done for you. And I'm going to perfect that love in you as you walk with me. I am going to perfect that love. How many of you know it's, it's hard to really love like God loves? If God's not making me love like him, I'm never going to love like him. But I need to see how much I don't love him by the way that I treat people. Because if I can see that I don't love God because of the way I don't love people, it makes me broken before God under the light of his word. And the Holy Spirit begins to minister to me and reveal to me what manner of man. And I'm like, okay, God, I'm just going to try harder. No, you're not. Or maybe you will, and guess what's going to happen? You're going to fail. But if I can see that, Lord, I'm not loving like you want me to love, I need you to work this in my life. I'm going to confess this in agreement to you, that I am not a loving person. My mouth don't speak right. My actions don't speak right. And dare that I would go into a world and manifest something that's not you. Are you hearing me today? The Bible says, my sheep hear me and they follow me. We're going to leave different today. Beloved friends, listen, we're not going to leave this place the way we came in. I sure won't. I might be the speaker, but I'm the listener as well. This word is for me. Walk with me. Y'all have read this a million times. 1 Corinthians 13, your pastor probably preaches it all the time. You hear it all the time. You read it all the time. People read it at weddings. But I want to read it again this morning, and I want to read it from the Amplified Version if I could this morning. I study a lot. I use King James, New King James, ESV, NIV, um, New American and Standard, and Amplified Bible. So I study a lot. And you say, why do you do all that? Well, I like to see what the Amplified Version, because it kind of amplifies what we normally would read in New King James. So this is the, the, the passages or the chapter of love. They, they do it at weddings all the time. But I want you to really just listen to what God is saying for us right now. Listen to this. It says in verse 4, love endures with patience and serenity. Love is kind and thoughtful. Love is not jealous nor envious. I want you to just think about your own life right now. I'm thinking about mine. I'm already convicted and I'm only just a couple ways in it. Love does not brag, it is not proud or arrogant. Love is not rude. Love is not self-seeking, it is not provoked, nor overly sensitive or easily angered. Love does not take into account a wrongdoing. You did that to me, I wrote it down, I'm not going to forget it. What if God said that to you? Ha ha, look what you did, Aaron. I got your number, bro. You're on my list. I'll never forget that one, buddy. Is that Jesus? Is that us at times? 
What if Jesus did that to you? Would you like that? That's, I love the passage. Do unto others as you have done unto you. Hallelujah, brother. Out the window. Because I find I do it quite often. But I'm being conformed. This word is changing me. I'm not what I was 10 years ago. And I can't wait to see God's work 10 years from now. Because he's at work in all of us. Amen? Amen. Love does not rejoice in injustice, nor rejoices. He rejoices in truth. Love bears all things regardless of what comes. Love believes all things. You know what that means? To look for the best in every person. You ever made the statement, no hope for them? (laughs) You just don't know them, bro. Preach it, preacher, but you don't know them. You don't know how they treat me. You don't know what they do. There's no hope for them. There again, what if that was you? Would you want people saying that about you? There might not be no hope for me, but there is always hope in Jesus Christ. There's always hope for every human. They will fail and you will fail. There's no hope in you or them, but there is hope in Jesus Christ. Therefore, love never stops hoping or believing the best that can happen in any single person. Amen? Love hopes all things, which means remaining steadfast through difficult times. Love endures all things. That means it never weakens or bows down. And the last one, Love never fails, it never ends, it never fades, and it never says, I'm done with you. It never says, you know what, I've had enough, I'm done with you. Well, preacher, I mean, bro, you know, that's kind of hard that you say that, and um, you know, you don't know what I'm dealing with. I get beat all the time. My spouse is drunk. They come home and they beat me every day. And I'm done with that. Hey, I get it. Are you done with them? Are you done with the fact of believing that God can't save them or change them? So when love says that it never says I'm done with you and love never fails, That doesn't mean that you continue in enjoying the sin that they are abusing you in. But you're done with them is not done with them. You're still believing that God will save them. You can be done with the sin. You don't have to live in the environment with the sin. But God's not done with you. He's not done with them. That's love. You hear me today? Love never says I'm done with you. No mic drop. I'm done. Because you know what? If that were the case, how many failures do we have? All the time. What if God says, you know what? My gosh, bro. How many times you been in this altar praying for this? Seriously? You just prayed for it last week and told me you were going to do better. Now look at you. I'm done. You know what? This is like the 50th time. In fact, how often should I ask my brother's forgiveness who sinned against me? 70 times 70. Oh, you're over, you're, you're, I'm done. That's it, bro. No more. I'm done with you. Does love do that? Aren't you glad? So, if God so loved us, what are we to do? How hard is it, guys? It's very difficult, isn't it? How hard do you think it is for God? Not hard at all. Agape love always is shown by what it does because actions speak louder than words. How many of you know that? You remember when the woman, I want you to think about this in forgiveness towards you. And I want you to think about this in mercy that God has shown towards you because there's a world out there that's got a lot of sin involved in people's lives. And we now as Christians can look at people that are not saved and kind of get a little sour face with them. 
You see people that are maybe homosexual. You see people that may be uh, other or whatever. Drunkards, fornicators, idolaters, liars. And you're like, well, that's not my life no more. And I just don't want to be around that. Jesus was always around that. If that were the case, he'd take us out of the world. But he didn't. He left us in the world. Are you hearing me this morning? So sometimes we don't want to show much mercy on some of the things we don't like that people are sinning in. But I'm going to tell you here this morning, listen to this. There was a woman in the Bible caught in adultery. Y'all know the story. She was brought into the, into the, uh, the square where all the people were, where Jesus was. She was thrown on the ground half nude. This very woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law says, Stoner, what do you say do? No reply from Jesus. Now here's a group of godly people that are wanting to show no mercy on this sinner. And guys, there's times when we look into our government and we're like, no mercy. Done with that. I don't like that government. I don't like this color. I don't like that color. I'm done. No mercy. What if, what if God did that towards us? A woman caught in adultery. This woman's been doing this for years. She is a sick, disgusting sinner, according to the religious people. We want to stone her because she deserves death. That's what the law says, right? And so it was. What do you say, prophet? What do you say, Mr. Son of God? No reply. On the third time, Jesus said, you that are without sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. One by one, they begin to leave the building. Just her and Jesus left at the end. Where are your accusers now? They're all gone. Well, I don't accuse you either. Go and sin no more. That woman on that day, her sins were forgiven. But did you see how the religious acted towards her? How many of you want to be like that, like those religious people? No way. Have we ever been guilty of being like that? Absolutely. How many of you want Jesus to push all of that mess out of us? Amen. Amen. We might not be looking at the woman caught in adultery, but boy, we would watch TV and point our finger at that government. And look, I'm not pleased with what goes on to the government either. I'm not going to applaud them by any means. But I do know that God is in control. I do know that God puts kings in, in authority. I know that if they're in there, God allowed it. And my steps are ordered by God. I'm a child of God. Amen. I don't really care what they do, yet I do. But hey, it doesn't matter either way. I'm going to win. If you're a child of God, we win, guys. The book's written. But until then, we'll fight for what we need to, right? We'll fight for our rights. But I'm going to tell you what, if I look at what I think is disgust and show disgust and find my conversations among the world entering into their disgust, and now they hate the government or they're talking bad about such and such in this office or that, and I'm entering into that, what makes me any different? Uh, really, I've been guilty. That's why I'm preaching it so well. Holy Spirit said, that's not me at all. Mercy. Mercy like that woman. Mercy like I showed you. Because you know what? Before you were born again, you were no different from them. How many of you know that sin is black? The wages of sin is what leads to death. Not sin, sinful actions, this particular sin. Sin, straight across the board. You sin one, you broke the whole law. You broke them all. And there's none good, not one person, according to this great book. So God showed mercy out of his great love. He pardoned that lady from her sin, just like he did you and I. But had he agreed with them, they would have stoned the poor woman, and she'd have had no hope of mercy. But Jesus, the love of God displayed in a human brought mercy to that woman just like he did us. Aren't you glad for that? Can we give him a round of applause? That's the good news that we get to share with the world out there. There's, you're not done with. God's not through with you. 
Today, you've got breath and ears to hear, hear what God is saying. Today is the day of salvation. Amen? That's good news for us, guys. Actions speak louder than words. You remember this? So Jesus is about to have his last supper with his disciples. And when he comes into the building, they're having a gathering in an upper room. Normally in this upper room, when people would gather into a place where they're going to eat, men walked on the dirt road. Y'all know the story. Their feet were dirty. Everyone would come in. They would always have a servant that would wash the feet. At this particular gathering, there's no servants. It's just Jesus, his 12 disciples, and whoever owned the house was downstairs. They're in the second story. So Jesus comes in. All of the disciples are there, even Judas, in whom was a devil from the beginning, and Jesus knew it, yet he was at that table eating with them as well. Hear me. It's very important to know that Judas was there. A devil from the beginning. Jesus knew it. He was a thief. He stole from the money bags. He was in that group that Jesus very much picked. He watched the miracles. He traveled everywhere for three and a half years. Up to this point, Jesus loved him the exact same way that he loved the rest of them. And they're at the table and Jesus is down at one end and the disciples are mumbling and having a slight quarrel about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And one of the disciples' mom said, hey, would you grant, you know, one of my sons to be on your left, the other one to be on the right? And Jesus said, that's not for me to determine. That is my father's determination. Only he makes that decision. And all the other disciples were just infuriated because I'm the greatest. And Jesus has taken note of all of this because he's very smart. Now he's about to go to the cross He's about to get hung out to dry by Judas. The soldiers are going to come get him. They're going to beat him and murder him within hours from this. And Jesus is having this meal, you know, in his earthly body for the last time before his glorified state. And this is what's going on at the meal. And Jesus is not worried about the agony that he's about to go through. He's thinking about his very disciples He's loving on them and thinking about how he's going to continue to work in their life. So he's listening to all this bickering and murmuring. And before the meal was brought out, Jesus gets up from the table. And they're all looking at him and thinking, all right, what's going on here? And Jesus takes off his outer garment. He reaches down on the floor and he picks up a towel. And he wraps that towel around his waist and tucks it in and he grabs a wash basin. And now they're like, oh, seriously, is this, is he really doing what we think he's doing? He begins to put water in the wash basin and he walks to the first disciple and he kneels down. Now they know what's happening because they all know that every time they go to a feast, There's always a servant there that washes people's feet, that works at the house. Because the guests are the important people. Here's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. We're talking about God in a man's body is kneeling on the ground to some sinful men that he chose to put life in. And he is about to be the servant. Guys, can can you just really think about that for a minute? Think about all the ministries that we see flashing all over your social media. Evangelist Peter, power pastor such and such. Look at me. I got the greatest, biggest ministry. I do all of these things. Look at me. Not Jesus. Not God, because that's not how he acts. You know how he acts? He's down here. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. That's that's biblical, right? We just read it. He humbled himself, became obedient even to death. I mean, he's about to get murdered by the very people that he created. And here he is at this scene because the men are bickering about who's going to be the greatest And he's now showing an action that speaks way greater than words. 
I'm about to put on a display for these guys. And he begins to wash the feet. And when he gets to Peter, Peter's like a very humble state at this moment. He is like about to burst into tears and he says, no way. Jesus, you're not washing my feet. No way. Nope. That ain't going to happen. We should be washing yours. And he's almost to the point where he's about to apologize that he didn't get up and wash everybody's feet. Because nobody else did it. But now you, our Lord and our master, you're going to wash my feet? No way. I should be washing your feet. Shame on me. Is what he's basically saying. And Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And he says, well, if you're going to wash my feet, he's thinking about salvation. I need my whole body washed. I need my hands washed. I need my head washed. Because I'm not any good. And Jesus said, you're clean. I've made you clean already. You don't need that to happen again. But you need your feet cleaned. Every day. Every day. He began to wash his feet and he got to Judas and he went to the other ones and then he laid the towel and the pan down and he put his garment back on and he sat back in the chair that he got out of and he said, do you understand what I've just done for you? And I can imagine they're just like looking at him like you're looking at me and they're probably swallowing and thinking, dear God, <laughs> Of course, we know what you just did for us. But Jesus makes this statement, if you would look in verse, pardon me. If you would look down at verse, verse 12, if you would, if you could go to verse 12, it says this, and when he had washed their feet and he put out on his outer garment, he resumed to his place where he started. And this is what he said unto them. Do you understand what I've done for you? Verse 13 says, You call me teacher and Lord, and you are so right, for I am him. If then your Lord and your teacher has washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I've done unto you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Listen, verse 17. For if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And guys, I think that's very important when we read passages of Scripture and you see things like there's a reward. How many of you would like to be blessed by the Lord? We love God's blessings. We pray about blessings. We won't, 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 give me, give me, give me from God. And God wants to give all of those things and he does. But it's not all about all of that. How many of you just like to be blessed with Jesus? Is he not enough? Blessed are you if you do these. Do what? Wash people's feet. And what does it mean to wash people's feet? It means to lower yourself and think about other people more than you do your own life. It is serving in every capacity that's needed so that other people could be blessed. Blessings come when you bless other people. How many of you go through troubled times in life and oh, you just don't know what I'm going through, dear God. That's me, I've been there. I'm not taking away from your problems or my problems. They're real to us. But if you have not experienced this yet, I challenge you to think about it and ask God to give you grace to move forward. Pay attention to other people. Get into somebody else's life that's got problems too and bless them with encouragement. You'll forget all about your problems. You will. And when they begin to see what Jesus is doing through you into them, they're going to start doing it. And before you know it, everybody's washing one another's feet. Everybody's caring about one another. It's not about me no more. It's all about Jesus. Because I could say, well, it's not all about me. It's all about you. 
Now we're just shifting the, the, the arrogancy from me to you. And is it real? Because people say that all the time. It's not about me, it's all about you. But then actions are going to really prove that. So it really doesn't matter what Jeff Lee says. But how many of you know that it's very hard to produce a servant's life out of your own strength? So, God says, I know that's hard for you. So let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. How many know that we have the mind of Christ? How many know that we hear God speaking to us right now? God has convicted me. He's speaking to me. He has revealed a lot to me. While I'm speaking this, I'm the guilty guy. That's why I preach it. I'm guilty. Yeah, but preacher, you're supposed to be the one that's overcome and teaching us how to be overcomers. I sure am, but I've not overcome. I'm overcoming. I'm being made conform to his image and I will be there at some point. I'm on my way and I'm doing really well by the power of God, but I'm not there yet. But I will be because of him. And I know that tomorrow I will love differently than I do today. You know why? Because I'm going to trust God today to do something in my life to where I'm never the same again. And all of the people in my life that are aggravating me, getting under my skin, they've done enough damage to me. I'm sick and tired of dealing with that. I am going to be able by the grace of God, not because somebody preached it and now I have to do it, but by the grace of God, I get a revelation of my sin. I get a revelation of my weakness. I get a revelation of all about Jeff Lee. The Holy Spirit is doing that in me. And all he's saying is, Jeff, I just want you to see that you're not trusting in me. You're not walking in me. You are trusting out of you. You're all about you, you, you. But don't you know that I showed you mercy? Yes, God. Then go show mercy. Amen. Don't you know how much I've forgiven you? Yes, God. Then why are you having so much trouble forgiving them? I don't know because they did that to me. Well, you did that to me and I forgave you. I washed your feet. I took care of you. I looked after you. I've encouraged you. I died for you. I laid my life down for you. Yeah, but God, it's so hard. I'm just tired of being abused. I'm, I'm tired of going through this. Well, I know what you're dealing with. I feel your pain. I know what's going on. Can you just trust me? Didn't I say I'd never leave you or forsake you? Didn't I say I'd be with you to the end? Don't you know I'm working in your life? Don't you know I'm working in their life? Yes, I do know that. But stop it, Jeff. Stop it with the butts. Yeah, but no more. No more butts. Yeah, but... Yeah, but don't we do that all the time? Yeah, but God, I know about your butts. But just give it to me. You know what you do or what I do when I say, yeah, but God. There's a lack of faith there. I know you can, but... There's no, no buts with God, guys. He, he, he washes those out. Because God can. And God will. And God is. God hopes all things, believes all things, endures all things. And God never stops. And when we get to that place where we're not hoping for all things, we're not believing all things, and we're not showing love and compassion and mercy and forgiveness, God says, look at you, but trust in me. I can make you perform this if you can just see you. So guys, I believe our greatest victories in life is not that we so much see the sin, but that we see the one who comes to forgive us the one who has laid his life down for us, 
The one who is delivering us every single day because when I get a revelation that Jesus has done these things for me and I remember what manner and measure of man I am, I can be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. And then go away and say, well, I just forgot what manner of man that I am. No, I know what manner of man that I am. How many of you know God is good this morning? I'm, I'm so thankful for his mercy and his grace and his kindness towards me. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to conclude with this. If God so loved us, we ought to love others. My sheep hear me. My sheep follow me. Can y'all say that with me? My sheep hear me. My sheep follow me. So listen, sheep of God, listen up. Your father's showing mercy on you today. I'm, a, I'm honored to be a sheep of God this morning. I'm honored to be a part of his fold. I'm honored that he's my shepherd today. I'm honored that he's working in my life today. God, I pray that you'd help us to show mercy and grace and forgiveness and patience and long-suffering and gentleness. God, help us this morning. I'll read this last passage, 1 John 4, 20 and 21. If somebody says, I love God, and he hates his brother, he's not telling the truth. For he who does not love his brother, whom he can see, how can he love God, who he's never seen? And this is the greatest commandment of this wonderful book. He who loves God must love his brother also. Guys, I know you hear God loud and clear this morning as well as I. These altars are open. Can we spend a moment and talk to God and say, God, I hear you today. Can can we just do that? I'll be the first one in this altar. God, I hear you today. And guys, I really mean that as your preacher this morning. Before God Almighty, I hear you today, God. I, I, I see me today, God. I see me. And I, I know how much you love me. And I need you today, God. I need you to work in my heart. I don't want to continue like I do. I don't want this world to get a misrepresentation of you. And I can't do it without you, God. Please help me. Please help me, God. Have mercy on me, Jesus. Help me to show mercy, God. Help me to forgive those that use me. Help me to pray for people. Help me, God, not to hang on to past things. Grudges held, God, help me. Help us, God, in this place today. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you, I hear you. I hear you, Jesus. I hear you, God. Please make me a foot washer. Let me serve my brothers and sisters, God. Let me be quick to see where I can serve. Help me, God, not to be so selfish and self-centered. It's not about me. It's all about you, God. You're so merciful to me, God. 